Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreatorepen.com and today I'm back with Jim Cookwell. Hi Jim. Hey, how you doing, Joe? Good I'm, to see you. I'm good. And actually, it's been a while since you've been on the show. So just a little introduction in case people don't know you. Jim is the author of 10 nonfiction books and has been in internet business for over 20 years. He runs Author Marketing Club and co-hosts the Sell More Book Show with Brian Cohen. And his latest venture is businessaroundabook.com, which is very cool. So Jim, I wonder, you know, maybe just start by telling us how have you used books specifically as an integral part of your business journey over the years? Well, absolutely. I mean, the nonfiction book business is uh, based upon the fact that, you know, you're solving a problem, right? Fiction is entertainment and solving a problem is nonfiction. And those are the two reasons people use the internet to solve a problem or to be entertained. Mm -hmm. So when you think from the nonfiction book perspective, that's the whole point. Somebody wants to get a solution to something. They want to learn more about something. They want to know how to do something. So you write a nonfiction book and you put it out there and people come to you and they say, oh, well, that was very helpful. Can I hire you to actually help me do it? Because one of the biggest rules that you learn in business is you can tell people all day long how to do something, but the truth of the situation is, Joe, they want somebody just to do it for them. There's a, there's a tiny amount of people who want to sit down and do the work, but most people just want to have somebody have them do, do it for them. So that's the basic whole concept of business around a book and, and nonfiction books. And that's why everyone who writes a nonfiction book should be focusing on the same strategy is writing great content in a book form and then using it to generate sales or products or leads or whatever in a different way. But then again, you get guys like Steve Scott who are writing nonfiction books where they don't really have a back end, right? They have, they have content they give away. But as far as I know, Steve Scott doesn't do consulting. Steve Scott doesn't do many speaking gigs and things like that. So he's making money directly just from the sale of his books, uh, which is, which is uh, admirable, right? Mm -hmm. So there's two ways you can do it. Yeah, uh, Steve has courses now, I think, Authority okay. Authority Pub, when, and we'll come back to the sort of monetization. But just focusing back on your journey, you uh, did a book with Wiley, which is how I find out found out yeah. about you years ago, back when I lived in Australia. Um, this book will make you money, I think it was called, which, oh, it, it, on the video. Yeah, okay. The attention, yeah. Oh, attention, yes. But Attention, this book will make you money. Yeah. So, yeah, I did this with Wiley. I think it's seven years old now, 75,000 word book. Um it was uh, my first foray into, and my only foray into traditional publishing. Mm. And um, it's the genesis for my business now. I've since been a self-publisher. Um, I firmly believe that traditional publishing, uh, I don't want to start that whole argument, but I firmly believe that for a nonfiction author, it still makes sense to traditionally publish if you can get the uh, somebody like a big publisher to sign you on. Because if you're going to do speaking gigs and things like that, um, uh, event bookers and people like that still like to have that, you know, that, that hardcover book, right? They still like that, that whole thing about it. But in a general sense, I, I think if you're, if you're, uh, if you're just trying to, uh, get things done quickly, uh, self-publishing is probably the way to go. So yeah, so that's why I started with traditional publishing and I've self-published since then. Mm. And obviously now we can do hardbacks with Ingram Spark. Yeah. So I just thought right. I'd mention that. But that, but talking about the business, how is the business? Because you know, you and I were going to we're going to talk about money because there's not many people who are, who seem able to talk about money in the writing space. But you know, in terms of the practicality, how is the business version of um, publishing with a traditional publisher different to the business of self-publishing? Like, how is the revenue different and the cost different? And well, is, is it actually even a business using a traditional publisher, actually? Yeah, it is, because if, if you take the mindset of the business around a book and you use the book as the lead generator, right? Um, however, I do know many um, nonfiction authors who write books in the nonfiction space who make a lot of money selling their books. And, and you have the tiered level people. You have the Malcolm Gladwell people, the Seth Godin people. They're up here at the top. And then you've got the mid-tier people um, – like uh, Chris Brogan and uh, Scott Stratton and and people like that who write books and and they sell books. Joe Paluzzi, who owns Content Marketing World, you know they sell books, but they don't sell a hundred thousand books. They're selling maybe you know ten thousand, twenty thousand books in a year. And the problem with the traditional publishing model, 
when you were only selling 10 to 20,000 books a year is you're not making a lot of money directly from the sale of the books. So that's the majority of people who are not Seth Godin's and Malcolm Gladwell's. And, and so when I look at the business situation of traditional publishing, you know, it's more likely that you're going to make more money selling your book or indirect sales from your book than trying to be one of those big tier uh, people. So that's really the business. And by the way, it's more difficult than ever to get a traditional publishing contract now. Like when, when attention came out, you know, eight years ago when Wiley approached me, you know, they approached me and probably 150 other people in my space, the blogging and affiliate search community, and they signed every single one of us because they go with the venture capitalist model, which is we're going to sign a bunch of people and hope that one or two of them turns into be to, turns into be the next big hit. Right mm. now, obviously, my book didn't sell as many copies as I hoped it was going to sell. But however, this book has generated uh, an income for me and my family for the last eight years based upon the consulting that I've done out of the book. And so that's, that's the beautiful part about it. And it is interesting because now, like you say, sort of eight to 10 years ago, they were going after the bloggers and now it's Instagrammers, YouTubers right. uh, that you see in the shops. Um, it's interesting right now in America, you know, one of the top selling books is a poetry book based on Instagram poet, uh, Rupi Kaur. And I thought, and she's selling more books than like, you know, anyone. It's incredible. So yeah, things have, things have changed in one way, but not in another, as in traditional publishers still want people with a platform, right? Well, even more so than ever. So like when I uh, got signed on with Wiley, I had, I think, 20,000 Twitter followers at the time. I don't use Twitter anymore. And um, I did have an email list. And that was part of why they signed me, but not the big reason. Now it's like the entire reason you're getting a contract. I mean, obviously, you're going to have a good book, right? But I think they'll overlook the flaws in your content if you have a following. Mm. And you know, when an agent or traditional publisher goes and looks for somebody now – they're looking for email list count. They're looking for Facebook following. They're looking for Instagram. They're looking for whatever, all of these, these different things. And that's why I always tell people if you're looking to build a brand around yourself and actually get a contract like that and actually get a book deal, you're going to have to have that stuff mm. because they're just not going to take a leap of faith and sign an unknown person on uh, without having a platform that they can leverage. And that's the craziest thing about me with traditional publishers. Is like, if you already have that platform, like, why would I go sign with you? Mm. It's like, if I already have 20,000 Instagram followers and all these, all these platform, why do I need them for? So they can print a hard copy cover of the book so it can be in some non-existent, you know, bookstore that, you know, I, you know, I, I just, I just don't understand that concept. Yeah, it is interesting. Well, just circling back, so right at the beginning, you talked about nonfiction authors having to solve a problem. So yeah. let's circle back to that. So how do people know what the problems are that they should be looking to solve with their book? Well, you know, just, you know, I always, when I did consulting, and I still do, when I go into a room of people who have a problem making sales, and we say, okay, well, how do we how do we get this done? And and I go to the sales team. That's the first place I go, and I get get all the salespeople into this room, and let's write down the top fifty questions you get asked every single day. Mm -hmm. And maybe they only come up with five, or maybe they only come up with one. But that's and, and then I go, all right, every single one of these is a chapter in your book. Okay, how do you fix this? Mm -hmm. How do you solve this? How do you overcome this? And and that's all it really is about is, is writing a great book content or blog or whatever is is determining what the biggest problems exist. You know, I always like to put it into the pain point argument. You've heard me talk about this on Sell More Book Show. I write about it in my books. How big is your pain level? When you go into the hospital and you have a kidney stone and they, they say, are you a one or a 10? And you say you're a 10. Well, your customers have that same pain point. And they need a solution to that problem. If they're, if they're at a 10 and you solve it in the form, whatever content you give them, a book or whatever, they're more than likely to hire you to help them fix the problem further. So that's how I would answer that. Yeah. So asking questions. And if you yeah. have even a small audience or go on Twitter and find a hashtag and ask questions there. So I just did a survey um, for my book, The Healthy Writer, which is coming out. And we got uh, nearly 1400 people answered, like with the their right. biggest actual physical pain points. So sometimes you just have to ask, right? Well, absolutely. And now you can take that content and put it right in your book, which mm. is a tactic I've used before as well. 
you know, news media do this all the time. I don't know if uh, in the United States, news has stopped being news and it's more just about reactions. So if you watch like the channel uh, three news here in Cleveland and it's six o'clock, like almost every story is let's go to Twitter for a reaction. <laughs> and then they have a reporter stand next to a green screen and it says, Mike from Astabula says this. And then John on Facebook says this. And I'm like, is this reporting? Well, it is kind of because you're, you're getting the feedback from the people. And that's where we are in the world right now, actually. When people have a problem uh, uh, or want to be entertained, they go online. You know, Google is the world's biggest problem solver. That's why people go to Google because they're the fastest and best problem solver. They determine the most results the quickest way. And then they go to Facebook. They used to go to Facebook just for entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. But now – Facebook's totally different. Go on your Facebook feed. Almost everything you see on there is, hey, I'm looking for a plumber. Hey, uh, can somebody tell me how to do this? So Facebook has become that resource, and that's the world we're living in now. And and frankly, that's the same approach you should be taking when you're writing your nonfiction books. Mm. So that's interesting. And you and I both uh, you know, have done a lot of content marketing, which is creating yeah. blogs or audio or whatever with titles that relate to the questions people ask. So what do you think, and, and if people don't know, SEO, search engine optimization, is kind of the bedrock of this content marketing. But people, as you say, people are almost preferring social media. So what do you think is the state of SEO right now? Uh, well, I used to own a search engine marketing company that is now one of the top 15 search engine companies in the country, in the United States. Uh, they completely took search engine out of their title and it's now called online marketing because <laughs> it's really not just search anymore. It's online marketing, right? Um, I believe that uh, I haven't done anything with search engine marketing in 10 years because it's, it's too competitive. It's too hard to rank. There's so much information on the internet. Trying to get your, your site to the number one spot on Google is an ep episode in futility, in my opinion, unless you make up a word, you know, or whatever. So I believe that authors focusing on search engine optimization is a waste of time, in my opinion. I think there are way more things that you can do that are more focused on actually driving uh, sales of your books and marketing and building your email list than worrying about writing articles or, you know, those types of things. However, I do know people who still do all those things and it does work for them. <laughs> you do a lot of those things, but I, I'm just telling you from my perspective, it's, it's, it's just, it makes me die inside when I say I have to go write the top 20 tips to whatever article to put on, you know, I'm just like, Oh, I can't believe I have to do that. I've lived that life. I don't want to do that anymore. I find more success in creating a short little video or going on Facebook or creating a short guide or something. But I guess it does work for some people. And, and I mean, I, you know, you are an author, you have books, but I would say you're not naturally a writer, as in you don't no. actively choose to write as your like best thing. Um, so no. I think, you know, people listening, I, uh, you know, I do a lot of writing for content marketing and I like that over video. So it's much more about the personality, I guess. But what you did say then is you said um, that there are better things in your opinion for driving sales. So now you have to tell us what are the better things for driving sales, uh, given all you, all that you know from the Sell More Book Show, like uh, it took, coming towards the end of 2017, what, what do you think is the best thing right now or some of the things authors should be doing? Well, you know, I mean, obviously, the biggest success I've had is Facebook and, and you can, we can t leave ad the advertising part out of it. Okay. Because it's complex and there's a lot of people don't want to figure it out and they don't have the money to hire somebody to do it. Mm -hmm. You can read the courses, leave that part out of it. The basic concept of just talking to people on Facebook or creating a group about your characters or something like that is in my opinion, one of the best things you can do. And then the second part of that is email marketing. And you know, email marketing is, in, in my opinion, the number one most important thing that you need to do as an author to build your list. We just did a story on some more book show this week. Um, and you, I don't know when you're watching this, but it was episode 184 or something like that. And we talked about a guy who creates uh, mini books on how to play guitar. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. Joseph was on, our, on my show, on this show. Yeah, yeah. right. And so people <laughs> know about this. But think about that for a second. He had like mm. 37,000 emails. In, at his disposal, and and thirty seven thousand emails. He could go on his phone, 
and say, I have a new book and hit a button and send it to 37,000 emails like that. That is powerful. You know that, Joe, because you do the same thing that I do. I build my email list. It's the number one thing I do mm -hmm. to build up uh, and to have more sales in any of the businesses I create because it's that instant. And they've been saying email marketing is going to die for, you know, 20 years, right? Yeah. But it's not going to die. People still like getting that. Now, you have to do it a certain way. But building your email list, I don't care if you're a fiction author and you write Pride and Prejudice vampire books. You still have to have an email list. And even if you only get 100 people in it, you got to start someplace. Yeah, I totally agree. And, um, you know, I started a, a pen name, which is still secret this year. And the list has like 30 people on because all I did was put a link at the back that says sign up if you want to know about books. But hey, it's got 30 people on. And like you yes. say, you have to start somewhere. And a lot of people hear the numbers that we talk about. And they're like, well, it's okay for you. You've been doing it for years. But we, uh, all, we all started with zero, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, that <laughs> argument doesn't hold water with me because... Um, I'm an overnight 20 year success story. Mm. Right. And, and I get it. You know, this is the, it's human to want to be able to have instant success. This is why people purchase products and solutions that are going to help you, you know, make $20,000 overnight in your underwear, right. From your house. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, it's human to want to be able to do that. And I get that. But in the back part of your head here, your brain knows that it, there is no like lottery ticket. There is no, and I, and I hate this topic only from the fact that it becomes so preachy when you tell people that, you know, they got to work hard. Nobody wants to hear that. Right. <laughs> I mean, like when I speak in front of a room of people, I have a speaking gig tomorrow morning. It's like, I won't say like, you got to work hard in there because everyone just tunes out. That's they get that blank stare and they're like, Oh, Oh, he's mm -hmm. just telling me I got to work hard. It's like, Oh yeah. What about the guy who I read about that got, <laughs> A million dollars in sales because he tried this t trick on search and like no no it's not happening to you and and it's and it stinks but that's just the way it is yeah and um yeah i think that kind of tough love approach is difficult for many people especially yeah. authors starting out because I, I i don't know what it is but in this in the artist perhaps industry or maybe it's just common human nature is you think that the first book you do or the first blog or the first podcast and you will be set for life um but you know tell us you know in your experience you know how how many failures are there compared to successes along the way Oh my God! For every, for every big success, there are two hundred. You know, I mean, the businesses, the ideas, the marketing concepts, the money spent. For everything I've done, it's you know. But you have to just keep going. You know, I have this service called Happy Book Reviews, and and the reason I'm going to bring this up is because, um, the people, some of the people who are signing up for that, we help them find reviews for their books, right? Mm. And we don't. And and some of the people who sign up for that, they send you their book. And I read the book and it's, you know, it could be better. The cover is not right. And I say to them and I say, look, you, you, we need to fix these things first. And they're like, well, no, let's just let's just go forward with it. Mm -hmm. And then they they end up not getting reviews or they end up getting a negative review or they end up getting people just not interested in it. And at, at that point, you kind of have to say you have to change the way you're doing things there. But that's human nature. People just want to just throw things out there. And I, I appreciate that because when you throw things out there, you find out if whether or not something's going to work or not. Did that answer the question? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, I think it's good. And I think it's important. You know, I got an email just today as we get these emails. You know, my book, my first book novel is out. It's not getting any reviews. No one knows it exists. And right. what shall I do? And it's so difficult because, you know, you know, my answer is often, to be fair, on a novel, different to nonfiction, I think, you're, you will become a much better fiction writer if you write more books. <laughs> Right. They <laughs> don't it, want to hear it, that answer either. No, because of the amount of time it took them to write the first one. You know, it's difficult. But I want to circle back to the business around the book thing, because you mentioned they're doing professional speaking. And uh, I'm off to coming to America next week to do some also professional speaking. So... And one of the things I've noticed and probably the number one mistake I have made with professional speaking is the audience I speak to. I love you all authors, but author gigs don't pay much. No. So what are your tips for um, getting paid decent money for professional speaking? 
Well, you have to be able to solve problems in a in an industry that has you know people that want those problems solved. You know, obviously, uh, author. You're right. A good example is authors. You know, I'm in the author uh, services business, not like you know that type of way, but tools and training and things like that. And I did my own show in Cleveland a couple of years ago, and um, you know, the, the the space just isn't there. There's not a lot of money in the self publishing space, right? There there's some startup companies and there's some medium sized companies, but they're not these giant traditional publishing you know companies. So you have to find and write in an industry where there actually is a really major need where you can go to the C-suite, right? So the executive suite, you know, that's the sweet spot, right? So if you are creating content that helps those people solve problems, that's where you can do really, really well. But there's so many more things to it besides just having the book that's got to be good. You've got to have a good speaking reel. You've got to decide if you're going to be a keynote or an informative speaker. There are two different types. A keynote is an entertainment Mm -hmm. uh, type of person who comes in, gets the laughs, and everything. there's a little bit of information in there, but it's kind of just like a, like a show, right? But if you're one of the like Jay uh, Jay Berkowitz who does the ten golden rules of of marketing, he's an informative guy, and he'll come in and go through the ten steps and and do that. So you're gonna have to have a speaking reel, you're gonna have to have a, a really good deck presentation, and you're gonna have to prove to people that you can deliver something that's going to make their audience go wow, and that takes time. And and takes money to build. I suggest going out and doing free speaking events and getting them filmed, uh, honing your deck, go to speaking courses, things like that. If you want to be a professional speaker, you can, and you're good at it, you can do really well with it. I didn't. I'm good at speaking, right? I'm very good at going stage. I've been on stage in front of 5,000 people, and I did a keynote presentation, and I enjoyed every second of it. I I get excited about it. However, I didn't like being on the road, mm -hmm. and. And my family is young. I have kids and I wanted to be part of their lives and school and events and sports and things like that. So I, I got away from it. I, I said, I don't want to be on the road. So it's just about a life choice, what you want to do. But if you want to do it, you can do really well with it. Yeah, I agree. And that's where you kind of have to decide what you want your life to look like. Right. Um, so just coming back to so speaking is one of the big things that nonfiction authors use for revenue. Um, you also mentioned consulting. So if people want to be a consultant, they don't need like any qualifications. Uh, what do you how, how do you suggest people would get started with offering consulting? Well, I mean, you're a problem solver. So people have a problem, so you're going to offer them assistance on how to do that. That's all there is to it. I'm speaking tomorrow morning to a group of coaches. Mm -hmm. So I got executive coaches, life coaches, you know, you name it, whatever. And I'll tell them the same thing. People want to have their problem solved, and you got to figure out what their pain level is. We already talked about all that. But you just need to – I think the biggest tip I can give for somebody who wants to do consulting based around a book is first use the book to generate the leads. Uh, the number one thing that I did – in this book that generated a lot of business for me over the last seven years was a very simple line at the end of the book. It said, if you want to have a no obligation, no, uh, no cost, 15 minute consultation with me, go to this website. And it was connectwithjim.com. And people went and they scheduled a time on my calendar. And I did thousands of free calls, mm. but those calls, but you know, one out of every 10 turned into a consulting gig, right? So it's lead generation, and that's the number one thing you got to do with your book to, to build that up. You've solved the problem in the book. Get them to do something. If you're speaking, you don't want to hard sell at the end, but you do want to say, look, I can help you. You have to be a salesman. I'm, I'm an elected official now, right? I'm a city councilman in a small town of 12,000 homes, right? And I go door to door and I talk to people. This has been the most amazing experience of my life in terms of the sales. I've done thousands of sales calls on the internet. But go to someone's home and knock on their front door and tell them about yourself and what you can do for them. That is a challenge. And I've learned about how people react to those types of things and how to read people. And you have to be a good salesman to, to do it. But you can be very successful if you have the right calls to actions in place. And here's the last part about this. You've got to have the right program, right? So consulting as a word, I hate that word because – People say – people hear consulting. They're like, oh, this is another idea person. Put something into a package. People love packages. They love systems. They love to know that I'm going to pay this and I'm going to get this. So have two packages. 
the gold and the premium or gold and the platinum. And here's what you get in the gold and it costs this much. And here's what you get in the premium and it costs this much. It's much easier to sell that than it is to just say, well, um, I'm going to charge you five grand and here's a couple of things I'm going to do for you. It's much easier to sell. Yeah, and we should make a point there that uh, being a salesman or a salesperson uh, is not scammy or sleaze. Well, it can be, but no. we're, we're saying it's more about actually being a good listener. Like what you're saying there is understanding people's problems and listening to problems. And the best salespeople listen and respond to those problems, right? Yes. And like I said, I can go to I can go on any sales call now or go door to door. And within 30 seconds, I can tell if you're open to my message or not. And, and that's just through experience and time. So if, if I notice you're not into it, I can just walk away and move on to the next one because that's an important lesson. You're never going to convince the people who aren't interested in what you're selling to buy. It's a very difficult process. It's education. It takes a lot of time. you got to find the people who are already interested in what you have. If you're writing Pride and Prejudice variation books, right? And you're targeting them to horror authors. You're wasting your time. Spend your time where, where your target audience is and where the people you know who are going to buy and craft your messages and sales to them. And again, sales gets such a bad term because you have all these scammy salesy type of people. Sales is just a, a mantra of promoting yourself. Uh, you don't have to be bombacious. You don't have to be outgoing, but you do have to be able to tell people why what you have, what you've written is good. That's why sales copy is way more difficult to write than fiction, in my opinion. You know, authors are great. You might be great at writing Pride and Prejudice variation books, but sit down and try to write two paragraphs of sales copy for your book or a book description, right? It's very difficult. You know this. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> put the right calls to actions in to talk about yourself, to really hit them. It's extremely difficult. And I've been doing this 20 years, and I still have to hire people to help me write my copy for my businesses and my books and things like that because it's very difficult to write. No, absolutely. And I do want to, you know, you mentioned there about hiring people. And I did want to ask you, because this is something I think about a lot at the moment, is, you know, when you start your own business and authors, when they put their first book out, you know, you're basically a practitioner. You're like the e-myth book. You know, you're the person who does the job and you're running a business. So and then you have to start learning about running a business. And then you get to a point where the business starts growing. So and there comes this and I'm I've booked time with myself next week Uh Ah. to to have a CEO day I've decided I need to act more like a CEO and I wanted your advice on what are the things that I as an author need to do to change my head to being a CEO so what are what are the things that the CEO of a creative business should be focusing on to take huh. the pressure off all the other things well I have experience in this uh, with a company that had 150 people, I was one one of the owners, so I wasn't the you know main guy, but I was a decision maker and one of the CEO type people. And uh, you have to really think of a CEO position as the visionary person who for the direction of the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, you you have to sit down, and you have to write down what your goals are long term for your business. Right? Is it to create 20 books? Um, is it to the company needs to earn this amount of money? It's, if it's your business, if you are the company, you know, I always, I, I wrote a book called business around a lifestyle. And one of the basic concepts in the book is, um, what's your number, right? So people have to say, what's my monthly number and how much money I need to make. That's a CEO decision, mm -hmm. right? So you may say I need to make $5,000 a month to pay all my bills, to cover everything I have to do and then have a little bit of money left over to go out to dinner or go see a movie or whatever. That number is a CEO decision. So everyone should get out a piece of paper right now and write down what that number is and stick it on the wall behind your computer or put it on your computer on your desk so you can look at it every day because now you know how much you have to, uh, to make every single month to reach your goal. That's a CEO level type of decision that I think everybody needs to put forward. And, and then once you have that number, this is the reason you do the number first mm -hmm. is because then you have that number, then you have to figure out how to get there. Uh, how do I accomplish that? Well, right now I'm selling $2,000 worth of books every single month. And if I wrote four more books, I could potentially increase that to 4,000, whatever. Or if I added a course 
or if I created a new book or whatever. You have to be able to write it all down and say, here are the things I need to do to accomplish to get to that number. And that's how it makes sense for me. And when that's why, and that's why I think it's a CEO level type decision. Mm. And it is interesting, isn't it? Because uh, well, what I think what's happened to me is I've reached I reached my ten year goals, uh, you know, about a year ago, and I'm still looking for the next ten year goals. And I wanted to ask you about this because uh, clearly, you know, you're now, as you say, working in in local politics, which um, everyone must know is not a money spinner. It's doing oh. it's doing it for serving the community. Uh, there is no other reason you would do this other than serving the community, as far as I can see, right? So, um, you know, where's that balance? Like people, what the, the thing in the indie community right now seems to be more, 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 and that's because many people haven't reached their number yet. So obviously right. you, you're looking for more until you reach that number. So when does the shift come when you want to change your angle to start serving the community more, even though you do that through your businesses as well? Like where was the tipping point? for you? Well, it's a lifestyle change. For me, it was when I had an anxiety attack and I thought I was dying, but it was just an anxiety attack. Uh, that was the moment when I changed because I was working way too hard. I mean, you and I have friends who really, really work hard, right? They won't mention their names right now, but they're working really, really hard. And I was in that position and I was doing uh, a very uh, too much and I had this anxiety attack and I realized that, oh, my God, I can't continue this way with my life. I got small children. I need to live my life. So it's a lifestyle decision that everyone seems that needs to make. Now, it's very difficult to make a lifestyle decision if you haven't reached that number, because unfortunately, money is the thing that drives most of us and keeps us secure and safe because, you know, we want to be able to pay our bills and our mortgage and our car payment and all those things. So there are lifestyle choices you need to make. Um, I could care less about the car I drive. I have an old beater car. I, I don't drive a fancy car. I don't care. It makes, it makes no difference to me what kind of car I drive. I don't live in a, a six-house mansion. I, I, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in is going to my kid's baseball game and his basketball game and my daughter's choir concert. That is my number one interest. And then I'm interested in um, my, uh, the, the local politics in my city. So those things are important to me. The, the business for me at this point in my life is like in the background. I do it because I have to do it, mm -hmm. but I don't, want, I don't, I don't want to work as hard anymore. And if that means I don't make as much money as I should, then I'm totally fine with that. Now in 20 years, I'm probably going to be upset. I'm going to be like, wow, I'm still broke. <laughs> I don't have, I don't have all of this money. And, uh, so, but you know what? I wouldn't have missed, missed out on it. So it's, it's a lifestyle thing. Yeah, and as you say um, some of the things you're not interested in. One of the things I know you are interested in is going fishing, which you yeah. see, <laughs> which you seem to do quite regularly. And I think that's awesome. And again, one of the struggles I have, and why I'm having a meeting with my CEO, is saying no two things. So you seem pretty good at saying no. And I know a lot of listeners have a problem too. So what are your tips for saying no, especially when you feel like you might let people down? Yeah, it's tough to say no when you're first starting, right? When you're getting started out, um, I said yes to everything. You know, free speaking gigs, you know, can you help me with this? I said yes to everything. Uh, but at some point, you do have to start saying no to things. You start, to, you, you have to start deciding which things are going to accomplish your goal. You know, again, go back to your pain level. You know, a lot of people have the pain level. You're probably writing books, but you have a full-time job and how, how much do you hate that full-time job? Is it a five or is it a 10? Mm. Because if it's only a five, you're probably not going to come home at night and spend six hours writing books because you know that down the road, you're going to make a lot of money. But if it's a 10, you know, instead of watching TV or playing video games, you're home every night and you're, you know, making something happen and you're learning about marketing, you're writing new books. So it's really everyone's own personal point in their life life decision of where they are in their life and how high their pain level is. It's really totally up to you. Um, there are some things that stop people from having success in those regards, like believing that other people just got success because they, you know, won the lottery or they got some special thing. Those are crutches that mentally we all do as humans to say, Oh, well, everyone else is successful and they didn't have to work hard for it. So why should I, right. You know, or, or thinking that, people are keeping you down or 
people, you just haven't learned the latest tactic or trick yet mm -hmm. or things like that. And it's just mental blocks that we as humans have in our heads. And I've had them as well. And I've had to work my way through them over 20 years. And so, so much of this does seem like mindset, doesn't it? Like, what, it like, the, like you say about the strategies and tactics, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't change that much. It's like sit down, write, sit down, build your website, do your email list. And then, you know, repeat. <laughs> I mean, right. And then the mindset stuff is, is all the rest, right? Yeah, the mindset is, is important. We'll get back to the CEO argument. If you're the CEO of your own business, your mindset has to be focused on your goals that you want to accomplish. And that's why I go back to that number. That number is really important because it helps me focus on where I need to go. Because, you know, as long as I reach that number every single month, that allows me to have this lifestyle that I want. Mm. And that's more important to me than the money. But it could be totally different for somebody watching this. They could be like, Jim, I don't care about, I, I want to work 80 hours a week and I want to make as much money as I possibly can. Okay, well then get your number and sit down and make it happen. But don't make excuses. Don't, don't come in and say, well, Mr. Robot was on and I wanted to watch America's Got Talent and instead of figuring out how to, you know, uh, promote my book on this forum or whatever. So it's, it, but it's totally up to the individual. Yeah, I think you're right. And, um, I will be, sh I, I might even share my CEO notes in the introduction to this interview Ooh. when it goes out. So we'll see, but I'll certainly be sharing it. Cause I think it's something that we need to do more as creator business people. Um, really. This is the hard part about this whole thing is that the, the initial uh, romantic dream of being an author that we've been sold since Gutenberg invented the printed press mm -hmm. was you're in a country cabin and you write your novel and then if you get it off the typewriter, <laughs> you get it off and then you put it in the box, right? Like on misery and you take the box and then you, you, you walk it over to the publisher's office and you <laughs> hand it to them and they're like, you finished it? And they give you oh. a big check. <laughs> they, and then they, they reach into their desk, they write this big check, and they're like, oh, my God, you're going to be you – know, that whole romantic dream of authorship is still perpetuated by many people. Mm -hmm. And until you remove that from your brain and understand that the entire business has completely changed and it's up to you to be the business now – and it's not going to happen that way anymore, your, your chances are of you having success are very slim. It's going to happen to a couple people, one, two, three a year. It's most likely not going to happen to you, and it's the harsh reality. So just get that out of your head and realize how the business works now. Absolutely. So tell us about what happens at businessaroundabook.com. What can people find there? You know, it's businessaroundabook.com, and basically it's if you're writing a nonfiction book or if you've written a nonfiction book, the whole concept is you want to build a business around it. We talked about it already a little bit, but there's so many things you could do to earn revenue from your book besides the sale of the book. I mean, I didn't make much money from this book directly from the sales. You know why? Because they sold this book to Amazon at a wholesale price, and then Amazon sold it at a retail price of what are twenty nine or whatever it was back in the day. But I only got you know seventy percent of the commission for what they sold it to Amazon for. So every copy of this book sold, I ended up making three dollars maybe, right? So unless I sold you know a hundred thousand books, I'm not making significant revenue. However, the indirect sales of this book is really where the money came from. So it. Your, your book can be turned into so many different things, courses. It can be turned into uh, consulting, speaking gigs. Uh, we are um, just so many different things that you can do. And that's what business around a book is. It's just helping people figure it out. You know, um, I have people who contact me and, and work with me and, and they're like, well, I wrote a book on I'm writing a book on how to save Christmas. Right. You know, it's like, OK, well, there are a lot of people who love Christmas, you know, so how do we write the book, use the book as a lead generator and then turn that into workshops in your local town or turn that into a course that you can sell to people in some other way? It's never been easier in the history of the world to create a product, a book, a business, a brand and put it on the Internet and instantly get business from that and a book is a major way of driving leads for that type of business so that's what it is yeah fantastic and uh where else can people find you what all the other things you've got going on uh obviously i'm the owner of authormarketingclub.com we've got lots of tools and training we've been around for seven years now um 
And we have over 30,000 members across the globe in over 105 countries. Uh, we've got a free membership and a paid membership, tools and training there, video courses, tools to help you as an author. And then, of course, uh, I have business around a book. And then we have a new service called happybookreviews.com which helps authors who are looking to get more reviews for their books. It's not a paid review service. All we do is you submit to us and we put it out to people who have reviewed similar books or people who are interested in reviewing books. And if they review your book, uh, then good. So those are the things I'm doing for authors specifically. I, I, I'd like to just point this out. The, the, the reason I do this for authors is because of the traditional book business. When I got into this, I realized that they didn't do any marketing for me. That's all of these businesses came because of a failure that I had when I signed with a traditional publisher and I had to learn how to do all this stuff myself. And I learned all the problems, go back to that, all the problems that authors have when they're trying to market a book. And that's where all these businesses came from. And that's where my businesses are built on. I take the problems that people have and I try to authentically solve them for them. Um, and the key for me is, at the end of the day, and I know you share the same thing, it's all about actually helping people. It's not about sales. It's not about making money. If I wanted to sell out and create junk courses or program that you know are scammy, I could have done that years ago. But my reputation is everything to me. So I would never, I wanna, my core base is about actually helping people. And if that means I gotta give away free information or not charge a lot of money for things, then I'm fine with that because that's just who I am. And, and that's why my business has been successful. And we should mention you also have a podcast. Yeah. Me and Brian uh, do the Sell More Books show. Um, we're on episode 184, over three years now. Uh, and it's a weekly uh, update news show where we talk about the latest, what's happening in the publishing world. Um, I think we just passed half a million downloads over three years. So we're not a huge show. We don't get billions and millions of of listeners but we have a very small group of people who are writing books who are very interested in hearing about what's going on in the world of publishing yeah check it out yeah i listen every week so um i definitely and i'm a patron of your show so yes. yeah it's a great show um and certainly you know you, you have lots going on so um people should check out businessaroundabook.com and the sell more book show and amc and everything and thanks so much for your time jim that was great hey it's always great to talk to you